morning sing with. If you will, please join me in our opening prayer. Here this morning, hymn number 378, just a little talk with Jesus. Amen. If you will stand to your feet and sing this hymn with you. Be 
Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. Behold, we count him happy with endure. Endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen of the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your nay be nay, and your yea, yea, lest you fall into condemnation. Is any among you late? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Yes. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have any committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. Amen.
Father, we come thank you for our learning down last night and the nurture rights of this morning. And Father, we thank you for another day of bread and portion of our health and strength. And you have allowed us to be clothed in our right mind. Father, we come this morning looking up to you as you to look down on us. And we stretch our hand knowing that there is no other one that we can call on. Father, we live in perilous times, mean world. Father, we realize there's killing and destruction on this street, throughout the land and the country and the world, whatever war and the room of the war. But Father, you said in your word that we have to look to you and lay down to our own understanding. And you would direct our path. And Father, we ask you to direct our path this morning. Direct us in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, and as we go from day to day on our job. Father, we ask you to look down on those that may be suffering this morning. Those that may be suffering sickness and affliction, Father. Those who may not have food to eat or the Lord shall deliver. And Father, we ask you to have mercy on those that do not know you in a part of their sin. Those that may be suffering because they lost a loved one, Father. But we know you say that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot be. And Father, you can say that we would look to you if your people who are called by your name, who would humble themselves and pray, turn away from their sin and repent, that you will heal from heaven and heal the land. And Father, we cry out for healing this morning. We can't do it, Father. We know it's all in your hand. Father, we ask you to strengthen us, bind our hearts in love so that one can't fall because he's leaning on another. Father, give us that love that runs from heart to heart and from breast to breast. Teach us, Father, to love one another as you have loved us, Father. Forgive us, one another, Father. And Father, help us to be the type of instruments that you need in this dying world. And stand declare that Jesus Christ lives. There is no way for salvation, Father. Father, you went to Cameron that we all may have a right to the tree of life. And for that, Father, we thank you. We thank you for food. We thank you for shelter. We thank you for the clothes.
that fancy car, you may not get all the riches in the world, but you know somebody sacrificed his life for your liberty. Is there anybody here you glad about the sacrifice that Jesus made? Anybody here glad he sacrificed his life?
Yes. And you can't thank God for anything else. You ought to thank God just for the fact that He's God. Come on now. Come on. And for the fact that God is good. Situations in your life may not be good, but God is still good. Yeah. And that's enough to give God praise. We're grateful to God for that. Grateful for all of us being here present tonight. Let's look like we have any visitors, but we're grateful to God that we're all at home today. Let me first of all say thank you to those who participated in our market day this past Wednesday. A great time of fellowship here with our community health initiative. And I'm grateful to God for the efforts that they continue to make uh, to provide us with information and resources to be a healthier church. Amen. So I'm grateful to God for our community health initiative. Let me also say happy birthday and happy anniversary to those who are celebrating in the month of May. And thank God for another season of life and another season of love. Y'all, we're already five months into the year. This year is not playing. It is moving rather quickly, but we thank God for his keeping power. So for those who are celebrating anniversaries and birthdays, we thank God for you. Let me also encourage you, if you have not taken part in our Sunday school or our Bible study on Facebook and YouTube, please engage in the Sunday school lesson. Listen, Deacon Rogers did a masterful job this morning with our Sunday school lesson, talking about being free from sin. Matter of fact, I took notes. He left a line that if he said it this morning, I would open the doors of the church and we would have went home. Here's what he said. He said, the grace that cannot change your life will not save your soul. What a powerful statement that we need to remember that if God has saved us, God has also saved us to something. And that same grace that saves us needs to change our lives. Some stuff that we used to do, we ought not do anymore. Some stuff we say, we ought not say anymore. If we say we are under the grace. So if you have not participated in our Sunday school, I encourage you Sundays at 10 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube, please take part of it. Our teachers are doing a masterful job of sharing the word of God through Sunday school. Also, Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6 as we continue to walk through the articles of faith. Amen? Amen. So come to a time of prayer. Several prayer requests demand our attention. Let's continue to pray for our church in its entirety. We are praying for Brother Mertz's Hazel Johnson through this hour of transition. Sister Mercy, it's good to see you. We are praying for you and the loss of your sister. We thank God that uh, God is keeping you in this time. Listen, I've always said that it's true. It's easy to have strength before the funeral. But the real prayer, the real strength is needed after you said earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Let's garrison with these families and let them in prayer during this time of transition. We're also praying for Sister Geraldine Anderson, who's back in the hospital, being prayed for her, Sister Cheryl. Pray for one another. And let's just pray for our church in its entirety. There's enough going on in our church, in our city. That if we prayed all day, we couldn't get off our knees. We just need to pray for one another. And that's what we come to do right now. If you're able to where you are, please stand in the sanctuary. Let's stand together in this time of prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you. God, thank you. You've been better to us than you've been to ourselves. Thank you for this church. 
Thank you for how you're keeping us, even in times like these. God, I pray for those who are dealing with grief among us. Comfort the bereaved hearts. Ease their minds. Let them experience the peace that surpasses all of understanding. God, I pray for those who are sick among us. Give them a little courage and faith to keep on going. And God, doctors may do healing, but we know that you do healing. So wherever they are, God, let them know that you are the great physician who has never lost a patient. God, for those who are here, for whatever needs they stand in need of, I pray, God, you have mercy on them right now. You know what's on their hearts. You know what's on their minds. You know what troubles they have in their lives. God, I pray that you intervene in those places. Pass them out of gentle say. Hear their own cries, whether it be on the job, whether it be in their homes, in their finances, their relationships, or even in their own health. God, whatever it may be, work it out like only you can. We lift our city to you now, Lord. We lift our nation to you now. You know where we are. This has not caught you by surprise. God, I pray that you continue to keep us as you have done in days past. Keep our faith strong. That when we cannot trust in anybody else, we are confident in the fact that we can trust in you. We can't put our hope in anything else. We know our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. That our hope is on Christ, that solid rock. God, I pray for those who are watching me with them and whatever they stand in need of God. As we continue in this service, God, have your way. Let your spirit reign. Let your spirit rule. Let your spirit abide in this place. That when we live here, we live here better than we can. And we will be careful to tell you thank you for what you have done. God, we say thank you for what you have done, what you are doing and will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
principles for the pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Let's just see what God has to say to us as we journey along this journey of faith. James had some helpful holy hints on how we need to live this life as we're on our way to Canaan land. So for the next few weeks we'll be looking in the book of James line by line, verse by verse to see what God has to say to us as we're pilgrims passing through this land on our way to Canaan land. Today I want to begin James chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. The letter of James, the epistle of James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. If you have it, please respond by saying, Amen. Amen. The English Standard Version reads, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greeting. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is God's word you may be seeking. time that's ours to share, I want to tag this text, understand the assignment. Understand the assignment. 
Her name is Katanji Brown Jackson. She is now the first African American woman to ever sit on the Supreme Court. April 7th of this year, she was historically confirmed by the Senate as the first African American woman to be a Supreme Court Justice. It comes after three long days of hearings from the Senate yeah, Committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You watched it. You saw it. You heard how they unwarrantedly attacked her character. They interrogated her about everything in her life, her record as a judge, her own character and personal identity, even attacking her faith. They asked questions on end that made sense to no one, yet despite the trial she faced on Capitol Hill, if you watched it, you noticed that she continued to go through those trials with a smile. Yes. Yes. At every question, at every interrogation, she sat there and smiled. And it appears that she had a joyful disposition even while she was going through the trial she faced. She did not come out of character. She did not lose her composure. She understood the assignment, faced this trial with joy, and then become what God has called you to be. Church, do you understand your assignment? Do you face your trials with joy? Do you smile in the midst of going through what you're going through? That's the assignment that James leads for us in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, the half-brother of Jesus, now the pastor of the Jerusalem church, provides this letter to pilgrims. He's writing to the 12 tribes that have been dispersed, these scattered individuals who are away from home trying to make it home. And this letter provides practical and providential principles on how to live life the way God wants them to live life. And in this letter, the first principle he provides is to rejoice in trials. He mentions many things in the letter. He mentions how you should pray for one another. We heard the scripture read this morning that we should come together and pray for one another. That anyone is among us, call for the elders and let's pray for one another because the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. He talks about taming the tongue because the tongue is our greatest enemy that we have. He talks about faith without works being dead. He mentions all of these practical principles, but the first one out the gate is to count it all joy. Could it be that James presents this to us because this is a great challenge that we face as believers? You don't have to be honest with me. I'll simply be honest with you. It's not always easy to rejoice when you're going through. Rejoicing in trials is a difficult thing because when you're going through a trial, you don't find room just to be hallelujah happy about what you're going through. But James commends to us that it does not matter what you're going through. If you signed up to be part of the family of faith, if you signed up to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are commanded at every trial you face in your life, count it all joy. All right. John MacArthur points out that this idea of rejoicing in trials is not our natural response. So the believer must make a conscious commitment to face every trial with joy. Here's the message of the text. Here's the sermon in a sentence. God commands you to face faith-building trials with unwavering joy. God commands you to face faith-building trials with unwavering joy. Church, you are going to go through some trials in your life. Young or old, rich or poor, black or white, Republican or Democrat, 2022 or 2023, it does not matter. You're going to deal with some trials in your life. Amen. 
But if you have resolved to make Jesus your choice, then you've also resolved to make joy your choice. It does not matter what you go through. It does not matter when you go through. It does not matter how you go through. Your response to every trial that builds your faith in God is this. Count it all joy. You need to understand the assignment. That in every trial you face in your life, you are to respond with joy. James here explains to us reasons why we need to understand this assignment of joy. First of all, joy is the prioritized attitude. Joy is the prioritized attitude. There's one word in verse number two that lets me know all of us are going to go through trials. When? That's right. James does not say if as though there is a possibility that you could be exempt from trials. James says when because God does not exclude any of his children from going through trials that builds faith in him. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. If you have confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have also confessed the fact that you will experience some trials in your life. Just because you got saved, it does not mean that you will get away free from suffering. All of us will face trials in our lives. The Bible is abundantly clear that those who are on the journey of faith will face destinations called trials. James says it here. Paul says it another way in 2 Timothy that all who desire to live a godly life will suffer persecution. Jesus says it differently in John 16 and 33 that in the world, in this world, you will have tribulation. If you just check the record, all of God's children, both past present and future have faced trials. Daniel faced trials while he was in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced trials while they were in the fiery furnace. Paul and Silas faced trials while they were in prison. Even Jesus faced trials while he was hanging on Calvary's mountains. If you signed up for this walk of faith, expect trials to come your way. You cannot Pick or choose whether you're going to face trials in your life. If you signed up to be with Jesus, expect trials to come your way. Now, it's important to note that the trials James is talking about is God-ordained, not self-inflicted. And there was a strange hush that went over the fellowship. These trials that James is talking about come as a result of you bearing your cross, not you reaping your harvest. And if you don't believe me, just look at verse number 13, because James says, let no man say that I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. It's one thing when God sends trials your way, it's another thing when you invite him, because you did something you had no business doing. The trials that James talks about here are those faith-building trials that God allows to come into your life to strengthen your faith and firm your trust in Him. And if the text is right, not only can you not pick or choose whether you'll face trials, you can't pick and choose which trials you face. It's right there in the text where he talks about these trials of various kinds. The King James Version says of diverse temptations. That word diverse in the original language paints the image of a prison. If you know anything about a prison, once you put one prison in light, you see multiple colors. One prison with light shedding on it shows many colors. In a sense, James says all of us will face trials, but we'll face them in different ways. We all experience the same thing called trials, but it's colored differently in different ways. For some of us, trials are sickness. For some of us, trials are grief, the loss of a loved one. For some of us, trials are depression or mental issues. Some of us, trials are financial 
burdens. Trials can be family issues. Trials can be job issues. Trials can be living in America with a target on your back because you have a different hue on your face. Trials can be dealing with issues in your life. It does not matter what you face. It may be different from mine, but all of us are going to deal with some trials in our lives. So don't turn your nose up on anybody because you may not be suffering today. But tomorrow will come, and you will face some trials in your life. And here's the challenge of the text. James lets us know you can't pick and choose whether you're going to deal with trials. You can't pick or choose what trials you face, and you can't pick or choose how you respond to the trials. Because he says it does not matter how the trial is colored, you have to respond the same way. Count it. All joy. The color of the trial does not change your consistency in response. Whatever you go through, however you go through, whenever you go through it, in every trial that builds your faith, your response is to count it all joy. Now here's what's messed me up in the text. Because as I was reading this, it's a paradox to tell anybody to rejoice in trials. Mm -hmm. It's a paradoxical statement to tell me to rejoice when I'm going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why in the world would James, by the providence of God, tell us as believers to rejoice in trials? The answer is found in this word count. Mm -hmm. This word count in the original language is a military term. It means to follow the cadence of a commanding officer. Any of you been in the military, you know that if your commanding officer calls you to march, you have to march at the rhythm and the pace that he or she tells you to march. Right. It also paints the picture of a metronome, Sister Romine. Right. For us musical folks, a metronome is this tool that keeps rhythm to help you accurately play any particular music. A metronome keeps time. Yes. So that way you don't fall off whenever you're playing a piece of music. That it doesn't matter what instrument you play. You can be playing the piano, you can be playing the organ or saxophone. All of us are listening to the metrotone, metronome so we can be on the same rhythm. Church, joy is the metronome of the believer. That it does not matter what sheet of music you're on. You have to respond in the same way. Count it all. Joy, no matter what you go through, no matter how you go through it. Your response and your rhythm to God's cadence in your life is this. Count it all joy. When waves of affliction sweep over your soul and when sunlight is hidden from you, whenever you're tempted to fret or complain, just think of his goodness to you. You got to count it all joy. Thank you, God. Notice the text says all joy. All let the church say all. Oh. Notice he doesn't say no joy for no trials. He does not say some joy for some trials. He says in every trial you face, you got to count it all joy. Whatever you go through, however you go through it, your response ought to be to count it all joy. Because joy is the prioritized attitude. Keep walking with me in the text because not only does James share with us that joy is the prioritized attitude, he lets us know that joy aids with the proper assessment. Uh, yeah. Joy aids with the proper assessment. Yeah. Verse number two gives us the command to count it all joy. Verse three explains why we need to count it all joy. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. He says you need to rejoice in trials because God is using these trials to build your faith in him. Notice the flow of the text. This word testing in verse 3 is consistent with the word trials in verse 2. God uses trials to try your faith. God uses tests to test your faith. God uses experiments to experiment with your faith. 
The text lets us know that God allows trials to come into your life in order to build your faith in him. That's what it means when it says steadfastness. God wants to build your faith so that you are strong enough to know that I'm going to stick with Jesus no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever I go through, I can rejoice about it. Because what I'm going through is building my faith, building my trust, building my confidence in the Lord. And that's why some of you are going through the seasons of life that you're going through. Many times we like to ask the question, where is God? When in fact God is questioning you, asking where is your faith? When the doctor says there's nothing left to do, they provide all the medical experts they can. You're asking where is God, but God is asking you where is your faith. When you've got more month than money and more inflation than funds, you may be asking where is God, but God is asking you where is your faith. When you're dealing with troubles on the job and you're ready to go, you're asking where is God, God is asking you where is is your faith. When you have troubles in your family, troubles in your relationship, troubles in your marriage, you may be asking where is God, but God is asking the question, where is your faith? God uses these trials to continue to build our faith in him. That's why we go through what we go through. God doesn't put us through pain for nothing. No, God allows us to experience the faith-building trials of life for us to have confidence and trust in him. Now, it's important to know what the text says your testing of faith produces. It does not say the testing of faith produces a new car. Amen. It does not say the testing of faith produces a new house. It does not say the testing of faith produces a new job or a new relationship. It does not say the testing of faith produces more money in your bank account. No, the text says the testing of faith produces steadfastness, a confidence and trust in him. And I feel that too many of us want to go through something just to get something. Yeah. All right. This text puts a knife in the heart of shallow faith. Yeah. This idea that if you go through trials, that God is going to bless you with that new car, and God is going to bless you with that new house, and God's going to give you money for going through. No, no, no. Sometimes the best blessing you can get at the end of trial is knowing exactly who God is. Yeah. And spare me from the Christian who has shallow faith that all they want to do is experience God's hand but never see God's face. Spare me from a Christian that all they talk about is going through something so they can get another job promotion, so they can get more money in their pockets, so they can get all the riches in the world, but they have not a clue who Jesus is. Talking about haters can be elevators, but you don't even see God on the elevator. Talking about all these enemies and everything going on, all I'm going through so God can bless me. But you miss the greatest blessing of all, knowing exactly who God is. God sends these trials to come our way so we have a clear understanding and a better fellowship with him. He sends trials to us so we can see him exactly for who he is. If you don't believe me, believe Bible. Remember Brother Joel? Job lost his family, and Job lost his finances in a matter of a day. Job lost his health. He was sick for so long till flesh fell off his bones. But at the end of all that Job went through, the greatest blessing Job had is found in Job chapter 42, verse number 5. He said, Lord, I heard about you before, but now I see you for myself. Come here, church, because God does not allow you to get sick just so you can pay some medical bills. No, God allows you to get sick so you can see him as a healer and a provider. God doesn't allow you to go through grief just so you can cash in on an insurance policy. No, God allows you to go through grief so you can understand that he is the peace that surpasses all understanding. God doesn't allow you to go through troubles in your marriage just for you to cash in on a divorce. No, God wants you to see him as the foundation of your family. God allows these trials to come your way so at the end of it all, you can sing with joy, I thank God for my mountain. I thank 
thank God for my balance. I thank God for the storms he brought me through because if I never had a problem, I never know God can solve them. I would never know what faith in God can do. So here's my testimony. I may not get the car, but through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. I may not get the house, but through it all, I trust in God. I may not get more money in my pocket, but through it all, I've learned to depend on his word. And when you can count it all joy, you probably understand the whole part of the process. You can say just a closer walk with him. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Yes, I'm going through, but daily walking close to thee. Let it be. Dear Lord, let it, let it be. Joy aids in the proper assessment. There's one more thing we need to look at in the text. That joy helps you process the assignment. Yeah. Joy helps you process the assignment. Yeah. Verse number four. James says that you need to let steadfastness have its full effect or let patience have its perfect work. It's an interesting progression in the text because as you look at verse three, it lets you know before you know. But in verse four, it says, and let. It is a gradual progression from knowledge to application. That once you know why you're going through what you're going through, go through it. Yeah. Yeah. Since you understand the assignment, yeah. do the assignment. Yeah. Since you know better, do better. Yeah. Because since you know why you're going through what you're going through, you need to let this process play out so God can use your faith to make you become like him. Yeah. And this is where trust in God comes into play because if you're going to go through these trials and if you're going to let faith mold you into his image, you've got to trust God without any wavering doubts. You've got to trust God, period. Yeah. In his book, Unscripted, Ernie Johnson shares a story of when he was diagnosed with cancer. It was a severe diagnosis and he heard from his doctor how severe it was. So as he was sharing the news, the first person he called was his pastor. He and his pastor went out for coffee one day and he was explaining to his pastor the severity of the diagnosis. He explained how severe the cancer was. And as Ernie was sharing this information with his pastor, his pastor pulled out a pen, grabbed a napkin, and wrote the word trust with a period at the end of it. And at the end of the conversation, the pastor asked him the question, is it going to be trust with a question mark or trust with a period? Yeah. Church, Trust in God was never tailored to be temporary. If you're going to trust God along this process, you can't trust him with a comma. You can't trust him with a question mark. You have to trust God, period. Let steadfastness have its full effect so you may be perfect and complete. Don't be alarmed by that word perfect in the text. God knows none of us are perfect. We in our feeble humanity cannot live up to God's standard of perfection. We are plagued with time. We suffer with mortality. Father time and mother nature will dance around us until we get dizzy and die. All of us are not perfect. What the text suggests to us is this, that as you allow faith to work on you, God is using faith as the vehicle to mold you and develop you to become like him. Yeah, yeah. That the end result of this assignment, when you count it all joy, is you're going to look exactly the way that God wants you to look. Yeah. This is why you need to process this assignment with joy. When trials come your way, you need to thank God for the trial because that trial is you being on the potter's wheel so God can mold you and shape you into the image that he wants you to be. Yeah. Do well, I have any bakers here? Anybody baked a cake before? My favorite cake is an Italian cream cake. I am amazed every time I see any of my family members bake an Italian cream cake because it's a messy process. They crack and whip eggs. They have to put eggs with flour, with butter, sugar, vanilla extract, and some other 
other ingredients. They have to stir the ingredients together. It looks messy. Then they got to chop some pecans or shred some coconut and then put that together. Then they got to pour the cake batter into a particular pan and put it in the oven while it's baking. Then they got to put the ice in it. It's a messy process. But at the end of the process is a sweet result because whatever those ingredients went through, it turned out to be this beautiful tasty cake. It was a messy process. It was ugly. It was nasty. But the process was necessary because the end result turned out to be exactly what the baker wanted it to be. So church, I commend to you, there's going to be some moments in your life where you're going to be cracking with it. There's going to be some moments in your life where you'll be stirred and shaken, but go through the process because at the end of it all, you're going to be exactly what God wants you to be. So if you see me and I'm not walking right, if you hear me and I'm not talking right, please be patient with me because God is not through with me yet. Because when God He wants me to be so church. You can smile in the storm and count it all joy because God is making you what He wants you to be. When you go through suffering, count it all joy. All right. Troubles in your home, count it all yeah. joy. Troubles on your job, count it all joy. Troubles in your family, count it all joy because this joy that, that I have, right. the world didn't give it to me. In the world can take it. So is there anybody here that's willing to count it all joy? Whatever you go through, however you go through it, your response is to count it all joy. Church, you need to understand the assignment. God has called us, commands us to face faith-building trials with unwavering joy. And that joy is not found in what you go through. That joy is found in the one who's with you as you go through. First piece of having that joy is having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are not here, if you are here without the Lord Jesus Christ, today is your day to experience the greatest joy of your life. And I invite you to experience that joy. If you are here without the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to experience the joy of knowing who Jesus is. It's so simple. Acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that he bled and died for you at Calvary. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You too can be saved and experience that joy if you are here. We invite you to come as the Spirit moves on your heart.
Amen. 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 